Let's go. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out today. Uh, my name's Joseph Irving. I work at PlayStation. Uh, give you a little bit of context about what I do. I work in a kind of centralized team at PlayStation called Online Technology, and we assist the various PlayStation studios with doing online stuff. Uh, and that's generally like hosting services, um, like backend services for games, or also infrastructure and best practices around doing that kind of thing. So, and what I mean by studios, these are studios such as uh, Guerrilla Games, who make uh, Horizon, they're, they're based in Amsterdam, some of them are here today, um, and uh, studios like Santa Monica, who make God of War, Insomniac, make Spider-Man, etc. These, these are what we call uh, PlayStation Studios collectively, so there's, there's many of them, um, but when I, when I'm talk about them, that's who I'm, that's who I'm talking about. Um, so we don't make any games ourselves, we just assist these um, teams with doing their online side of things, especially as PlayStation traditionally is more of a, at least these days, considered more of a single player um, company, but we're, we're moving into doing more live service multiplayer game style things. And that's what the talk uh, today is going to be about, like what are the kind of challenges of running these multiplayer games, especially if you want to do it in a Kubernetes cluster, like the madmen that we are. So it, here is um, the, like, Level, level say the table of contents for today, um, which I'm going to take you through um, about what the challenges of running these things in Kubernetes. And but like all video games, we have a mandatory unskippable tutorial that we're going to do first, um, and that is um, just to explain what is it, what is a real-time game server, what am I talking about? Um, and I will start by saying what isn't a real-time game server. So. A lot of games, so the, a game client is what the, the thing that actually runs on your machine, whether that be a PS5, a PC on your phone, that's what we call the game client, and that runs the game. And these often talk to a variety of different backend services that are running in the cloud or a data center. These could be like a leaderboard service with the highest scores or the fastest times for a racing game. It could be things like in Little Big Planet, you've got player generated content, player levels, or it could be an in game store where you can purchase items or something. These are, can be ran quite easily in Kubernetes. That they, they see themselves to that. There's an API, probably gRPC or HTTP API running in a Q cluster. And we, we already use this for a variety of different titles that need to talk to that, whether they be a single player or multiplayer game. Um, we, we often call them async. It's a term we use internally. And we say it's because these often happen in the background. It's like you might be loading this in or while, while the player's playing, it doesn't necessarily present itself to the player immediately. And therefore, we don't consider it as latency sensitive. And if these things take a little bit longer to respond, it's not going to completely ruin the player experience. It might just be a bit annoying. Um, so not, not, not late. it is latency sensitive, but not, you know, not in the way it will ruin your, your gameplay experience. Um, so what, what, if that is what isn't real time, what is real time? So real time, sorry, there we go. <laughs> real time is something like this. It's um, when you've got a group of players all playing together in the same kind of a physical or well, you know, virtual space, if you like. Um, so you know, in this example, we've got a load of players in classic World of Warcraft who are all gathered at their PCs. They've connected together. They're playing with each other, except for Leroy, who is finding chicken. Um, now. What might this look like? How, how do players actually connect with one another? So in, in some models, you have what's called peer-to-peer. -peer. This is when your consoles, PCs, whatever, directly connect to one another and send packets to one another. Say if I do something on my console, that gets sent to your console, and vice versa. And it's how you communicate. Now, this, this can work with you know, two people in just a 1v1 co-op, let's say. But then you know, we can introduce another player into the mix, and then becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, in this scenario, you might have one console is kind of elected the leader, and uh, this is what everyone connects to. And th what happens in this person's game world is what, what goes, effectively. It needs to relay back to other people what happened. Now, you might realize in this scenario, if that person's internet connection is unstable, or if their you know, console shuts down or whatever, the, the, all the other players at this point would lose the connection to the server and be booted out, um, which is one of the uh, issues with scaling this um, to, to lots of players. There's also the, player, the problem of trust. So everyone's playing on their own console, and then at the end, let's say they're playing a round of a game, like they can all then say back to the server, I won, right? <laughs> if I've hacked my client, 
Um, who do I know who to trust? All the gameplay was happening on people's personal machines, and at the end of the gameplay session, they could all report back different things, and we're not sure who's to trust, who, who is correct. Um, and this can be quite problematic in like a game where you've got ranked um, matchmaking or where league systems where people are going up in ranks. You want to be sure that the, what happened is what happened, or it could be a loot-based system where, where you're saying, oh, I just got the best legendary item ever just dropped, and then you tell the server that, and it has to believe you. Um, so this is one of the problems for using this for more like competitive games. You're probably going to want to avoid this approach. Um, some ways you can kind of avoid perhaps the kind of single person point of failure is to get uh, all the consoles to connect to each other. So you could form some kind of like mesh network, if you like, where everyone's sending packets to one another. Um, and this, this can work a bit better, but it's, you've still got a lot of network complexity potentially. Uh, for example, if I were to add just two more players to this diagram, it starts to look like this. Um, and if you can imagine, as we scale this up to like a 15 v 15 game, it wouldn't be practical to imagine all of them to be connecting to each other over, you know, going through people's personal internet uh, routers, etc. So this is where the concept of a dedicated game server comes in. This is a game server running in the cloud, data center, wherever, and all the players just connect to this and this only. They send all their information to that game server, and it sends them back why things happen. So you no longer have the problem of um, if, if one player's internet connection is unstable, it shouldn't as much affect um, the, the, the other player's experience. You know, one player can drop out, and it wouldn't cause everyone to be kicked out. Um, and it also, it's the thing that acts as a source of truth. So at the end of a match, it, it, it can be like, OK, well, I saw all these things happen, therefore it is true. And uh, yes, this person won or this person lost. Um, so what this kind of looks like is the game server is actually simulating the game world itself. So if you have your game world on your console, another person's game world on their console, the game server is also kind of simulating the same game world. So if one player moves their car in this example, it will send that to the game server and say, hey, look, I moved, I've moved over here. I had this collision. The game server will then kind of do the same thing in its game world, and then it will then pass that on to other players and show them that that's what's happened. Right? Um, this is, but at the same time, everyone else is also sending their information to the game server saying, oh, well, I've moved over here. So maybe like the player on the right thought they, they, they weren't in collision with that, that car. And it's up to the game server to kind of determine who was right, who was wrong. Um, this can come down to a variety of different logic that's way too complicated to get into, but it's, um, it's, it's the game server that ultimately decides what happens, and it's, so it's, it's, it's in charge. Um, and, and this is kind of how it works. It, it, they're, they're normally quite, they, they do some clever things like smooth out latency problems and stuff. Like a, a common thing is to predict the trajectory of like player paths that you can do. So if you imagine a player is running in a straight line, the game server will assume they will continue to run in that straight line um, until it receives a signal telling it otherwise. This is why if you've ever played a like online game and someone suddenly starts, you, should, you know running into a wall non-stop. That's because the game server's like, oh, well, they were going in that direction. They've disconnected, so they're, they're probably still going in that direction. And then they'll teleport somewhere when they come back, because it now knows where they are. Um, and, that's, and that's the gist of what a game server is. It's, it's something. We run um, remotely, and it is, it's um, very, um, it's, it's recording moment to moment. It's the, every action that players move, it has to record and track. Um, it's normally done over UDP because we need it to be low latency, um, and it's a persistent connection. And I say persistent connection, a persistent connection for the session of a game or a game session. So if you imagine like one match in a FPS game, like one round of a death match, that might be one persistent connection to a game server. At the end of the match, you would you would disconnect. But the entire match, you need to be connected. If you get disconnected at any point, you're going to get an error or horrible lag or something on your on your end. Um, and yeah, as I said, very latency sensitive. Um, any kind of latency problems, and yeah, you get your players teleporting around or slow frame rate on your end. You know, it can, it can present in different ways, but it's not going to be a fun experience. So we want these to be fast and not much in between. So some of you may already be thinking, this that sounds like a terrible idea trying to run this in Kubernetes. Um, yeah. And that is what we are going to do. Um, so running in Kubernetes. Um, so out of the box, it, it won't work uh, effectively. Uh, and that is where a project called Agones comes in. So Agones is an open source uh, tool by Google. Uh, you can find it at Google for games slash Agones. And it introduces 
a load of uh, new concepts and extensions to the base Kubernetes to make running game servers a much more pleasant experience. Um, some of the creator of Gones is in the audience, so please pester him, not me, afterwards if you have any questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna take you through what, how it does that. And I'll do that by talking about some of the problems inherent in running a game server in Kubernetes and how it can solve them. So the first problem we'll talk about is termination. So pod termination is something that happens all the time in a lot of Kubernetes clusters. The two most common reasons um, for like a normal pod termination would either be the cluster or scaler kicking in, so it scales down a node because it's no longer needed, the, the cluster shifted around and it'll drain all the pods off a node and move them elsewhere where it's more efficient. Again, you don't want this to happen if players are connected to the pod, because as soon as they get uh, this happens, they'll, they'll be chucked out the game, right? And the, the match won't finish or something. And the other one being deployment rollouts. If you're updating your version of your application, you, you, you're rolling out a patch fix, whatever, it will spin up new pods, and as they become healthy, delete the old pods. Again, don't want this to happen if players are playing there. And Kubernetes has no real concept of that. It, it doesn't know who's playing where. It's not. It's just not a concept it has. Um, so Agones has a new concept called a game server, which is a custom resource in Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, you can add extra resources that don't exist by default using custom resource definitions. And Agones uh, adds quite a few, and we're going to cover some of them. But this is like the most basic one, uh, and it's a game server. It, the, the, the thing to draw your eye to, perhaps, is the spec, which it, you might notice is very similar to a pod spec. And that's because it is very similar to a pod spec, in that it, each game server is one pod. Um, it maps one to one. If I create a game server, it will spin up a corresponding pod. And in many ways, it behaves exactly the same as a pod, but it has some additional metadata around it that's more game server specific. There's a few extra things in the spec. I won't go over all of them, but um, one thing to let draw attention to is the uh, container ports. So generally, we're running our game servers as host network pod pods that will just expose a specific UDP port. So if we're trying to stack a load of game servers on one node, they each need to know what host port to use. You know, they can't you know, have a static host port defined. It'll have to be something um, that's generated for them. And um, so that um, this is something Agonis can do. It can pass you. It will just pick you on that's not being used. And the game server can spin up on that. And we do everything kind of like host networks. It's quite common because of latency, right? We don't want to be going. There's no, like, there's no service meshes that we're going through to hit our pods here. Uh, generally, a game client will be connecting directly to a pod running on a cluster somewhere with nothing in between, no load balances, no nothing. Um, yeah, effectively, though, this is a pod. Um, it's, and you can see, like, to get game servers, it responds with some game servers, and each one of them would have a pod that corresponds with it. There's something else they have is some extra states, which are more game server specific. Um, and uh, in this case, they're in a ready state, which is quite normal, but we'll, we'll, we'll show how that differs. So how this works in practice is a player, person, computer, whatever, it can request a server from a Gones. And it will go and have a look if there are any um, game servers in a ready state. And if they are ready, it, that means they're not currently occupied by anyone. They're kind of unoccupied. It's like no players are playing here. It's just ready to, ready to go and play, play some games. And then it will return that to the player. And at the same time, it'll change the state of the game server to allocated. And this means that players are playing on this. And only by some kind of interaction can you change the state. Like, like the game server could say at the end of a match that, OK, I'm, I'm done. There's no one on me anymore. Or it can just terminate itself, and uh, anyone can spin up or something. But at this point, we know that there are players um, playing on the game server, and therefore, we should not terminate it. Um, and the, the way this is done um, from the user's perspective, or, or robot, or whoever does it, is uh, using something called a game server allocation. So this is how you actually ask for, for a game server, is you uh, create another CRD. There's another CRD called a game server allocation. It, it works quite similarly to how a like service selector works in Kubernetes, is a good analogy, in that you, you have selectors and match labels, similar to how you would map a service to a collection of pods. Uh, it's kind of similar with, a, with this game server allocation. You say, hey, I want some game servers that have these labels on them, for example. We're doing a match labels on this one. And but it also has some extra, more game-specific stuff uh, with it. And in this example, I've got players. Like, how many players can this game server fit on? Maybe I've got five players, and I'm trying to find them a, a game server pod. So I need one that's got five spots available or something like that. So it has some, some extra uh, 
metadata. But you create this, and then what happens is it returns back an updated version of the game server allocation with, in the status field, it's added the actual address of the game server. So the, the, the most important things here being the address and the uh, port, because this is what the game server client's actually going to connect to. So yeah, this is an allocated game server. It's ready to go connect to this on its UDP port. Now, everything I just talked about so far was just talking about one static solo game server. You know, you create one game server, you get one pods. But just like in Kubernetes, you don't generally just create one pod at a time. You use a deployment or a stateful set or something to create a selection of pods. And that's where Agon has introduced the concept of a fleet. Um, the fleet is very similar in, in concept to deployment. It looks quite similar from a spec perspective to a deployment. Um, but the difference between a fleet and a deployment is it creates game servers which then creates pods. So you, you create a fleet, and it creates a load of game servers in the state. And again, this is all very similar to a deployment, but the, the, the main difference is it's, it's aware of the fact that these are game servers and need to be treated a little bit differently than a standard deployment. So just to give you an example of how it understands that, um, in this, uh, here we have a scenario where I've got two pods, uh, well, what, four pods, two of them, two of the game servers in an allocated state, so that means players could be playing on here. We don't know, actually, but, it, but potentially people are playing on here. Um, and then two of them are in ready state, so that means at no point has this game server been given to anyone as, a, as an address to connect to. So if I were to do this command of kubectl scale replicas one, in a normal like Kubernetes scenario with a deployment, you would end up with, with one pod, right? Um, but in Agones, you don't. You end up with two. And the reason for that is it won't delete the pods if there's players playing on them. So it understands that there are people playing here, and therefore I should not terminate these pods. And it works the same way if you were to do like a deployment rollout. It won't terminate pods when players are still playing on them. So it, it's it's very much like a deployment, but just a lot more careful. It's yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna terminate stuff when people are playing on it. It's up to the pods themselves, generally, to say, I'm done, I'm ready, take me down. Um, so that's, that's the first issue kind of solved of like, how do we stop the pods being terminated all the time is using these fleets um, and the game service that they create. And the next problem we encounter is auto-scaling. So in a standard Kubernetes cluster, the normal way to autoscale your pods is either using a HPA or potentially a VPA, a HPA being a horizontal pod autoscaler, which is when you scale up um, the replicas of your pods dependent on some kind of metric. By default, you can use CPU or memory. Um, you can also use custom metrics if you want. But this kind of concept doesn't make as much sense in with game servers. Like, if a game server is running at 80% CPU, spinning up another game server isn't going to suddenly reduce the load on that game server necessarily. You can't just keep keep adding new game servers. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's not like a. It's not HTTP requests which we're just evenly sp spreading across a cluster. It's there's a load of players on here. They're playing until they've finished. Adding a new node's not going to help. Um, so yeah, it's more about the general state of the, the game, like how many players are playing, who needs a game server. These are the more the problems that you encounter when running game servers. Um, so again, we're going to have another CRD, um, which is the fleet autoscaler. So this, as an alternative to a horizontal pod autoscaler or a um, vertical pod autoscaler, we have the fleet autoscaler. Um, which is a way of auto-scaling your fleets. Um, and this, this one is the kind of default standard out-the-box one you can use, which is just, um, it uses a policy-type buffer. And this is, all, all this is, is it will make sure you always have a buffer of five, in this case five, um, five ready game servers. So if you've got five game servers that are allocated, you'll have another five that are ready. And then you know, as, another, as the sixth one becomes allocated, another one will get spun up that's in a ready state. So you just always got a little buffer of, of, of game servers ready to, ready to rumble um, as and when you need them. Now, this, is, this can work quite well out of the box, but potentially you need something a bit more advanced, a bit more specific to your game's exact needs. And that's where the webhook type of fleet autoscaler comes in. Um, this is like, is, think of it similar to maybe like an admission webhook. It's not really the same, but uh, it's um, a similar concept of you can, you can tell Kubernetes, hey, go talk to this service, and this will tell you what to do, um, which is kind of how validating and mutating webhooks work. Um, and but effectively, you can point 
uh, Agones to a custom service that you have designed, and it will tell um, Agones how many pods uh, it wants at any point. So the Agones controller will just you know, periodically get updates from this, this fleet auto scaler webhook, and this will tell it how many of each type of game server it needs. Um, so this means we you can uh, you can kind of code a lot more game specific logic into this this fleet auto scaler webhook. Like maybe you've got a lot of players coming in at the moment, and there's like a specific type of content or a specific type of level they lead, needed up, and therefore you need to spin at these kind of game servers, and it just allows a lot more fine-grained control compared to just using a buffer, which is a fairly simple way of responding to it. Um, and yeah, and so that's how you auto scale uh, game servers in a Kubernetes cluster. Then the final thing we'll get onto is uh, multi-region. So um, when you're playing a video game, um, you, you could be playing it from anywhere in the world. You know, there are people uh, playing games all over the place, and as we know, it's very latency sensitive when you connect to a game server. So you don't want to be connecting to a game server in the US if you're in Europe, for example, because the experience will not be fun. Um, so a general approach to this, if we have a gone as, well, a gone as in this case, but you know, you're gonna have your game servers geographically distributed. You'll have them in all different parts of the world and the player can therefore connect to one that's close by so that they have a good experience. Um, there's a few different ways of how this can be implemented in a game. You, you might have played some games where they just ask you straight up, like, what region are you playing in? Or I'm playing in Europe, and then they will point you towards European servers, or I'm playing in North American, and they'll just put you on some North American servers. Um, but you don't have to do this, and a, an approach that, like, Agon has, um, well, recommends and can help you with is, is like, a ping-based approach. So this is where you actually just ping from your game server to a load of different servers, and you work out which one gives you the best response time. And you're like, okay, well, I will pick this one then, as it's giving me the best one. And this can allow for more flexible kind of deployments of, of game servers globally, um, because you don't, you're not relying on someone selecting exactly where they are. You can, and potentially you can spin these up on demand, depending on how you do it. It also allows for players to play across region, because some games are so much, you know, if you're playing on North America, that's it, you're in North America. Whereas if you're playing in Europe, it's a different set of servers and a different set of people you can play with. This can uh, allow you to play with a, to serve people, though obviously you're still going to have some problems if you're in um, you know, the UK trying to play with someone in Australia. You might find a, a game server in the middle or something, but you, you might both have a bad time. But yeah, it's, it's still going to work better if you're close by. Uh, depends on the game. But so th this is perhaps how you can determine what region you're in. But like uh, the earlier example I gave of like how you get a game server is I created a CRD and. Um, uh, Agones gave me back a game server, and realistically, I don't think we're going to have every Cub PlayStation in the world start doing Kubernetes CRD requests to our cluster. So instead, we're going to use something uh, which we call a matchmaker. So going back to our earlier example, um, if in here, uh, Leroy had a group of people to play with, but afterwards he might not have done, um, at which point you need to find uh, some people to play with. And this is where Matchmaker comes in. Matchmaker is a piece of custom software that its job is to group players together um, based on a variety of different parameters. This is like what kind of content they want to do, whether they're playing a, uh, they're, they're doing, they want to play some player versus player experiences, they want to do some player versus experience, uh, a different type of raid or content or game mode, you know, whatever. It'll take it, all these parameters into consideration as well as the skill levels of each player because generally matchmakers are meant to try to make, like, like especially player versus player matches, as even as possible to give both sides a fighting chance. Um, though, if you ever look on Twitter, that's never true. Um, but it's the goal. But yeah, a whole talk could be done on matchmakers. They're a complicated piece of software. But this is what we're going to use to actually talk to a goddess. So, so a player will talk to a matchmaker asking for a match, and the matchmaker is what could actually go and find a server and return it to you. You're not going to be doing that integration yourself because um, that's, that's too complicated. But again, even then, like having the matchmaker go and talk, if we're, if we're talking about like global clusters all over the place, do we want the matchmaker talking to like a Kubernetes API in all, all over these different regions and having to integrate with them using like RBAC or something? It's, it's perhaps too complicated. So um, Agonis has a way of exposing the bit you care about, the allocation bit, via a service. And this is called the allocator service. Um, this, you can see it in the top left of the screen, is we have the allocator, Agonis allocator service, which like in this example, we put behind a load balancer. Uh, what this does is it exposes an API, either HP or gRPC, which a matchmaker, for example, could 
uh, query and send request to, and it will it will go and do all that kind of agonas allocation stuff on the behalf of the matchmaker, and then return it to it. It, uh, it, it authenticates by like mutual TLS by default is its authentication method. So you can, um, as long as the matchmaker and the allocator service agree with each other, they'll, they'll be happy. Um, but this allows you to abstract a lot of the kind of Kubernetes-ness of it all away from the matchmaker. The matchmaker just needs to hit an API, and it will get given back a ready game server that this cluster has. Um, so if you imagine this in practice with like multiple clusters, you might have the matchmaker, perhaps it's running in its own cluster or, or somewhere more global, and it will have a variety of like regional clusters, each of which are exposing a allocator endpoint. And if a player comes in and they say, oh, I'm in the US West, for example, the matchmaker would know, OK, well, I will go and ask the allocator load balancer in the US West cluster for a game. And this is how you, you might do a kind of uh, global um, regional deployment. You, know, you, you just, you've abstracted away the, the individual clusters a bit. It's just like, go, go, go hit these allocator endpoints. So all the matchmaker needs is like a list of allocators and what region they might correspond with. Um, and it, it also acts quite nicely for doing upgrades using an allocator balancer because that's another thing that's kind of important for these is, you know, as many of you may have experienced, doing a Kubernetes cluster upgrade can be a traumatic experience. And um, doing this when people are playing a live game could be very bad um, if they all get disconnected all of a sudden because we, we pulled something up. And so the general approach that Agonis recommends is when you're upgrading either your Kubernetes version or your Agonis version is to spin up a new cluster. Um, so if you're doing this with like uh, the allocator service, you could just have like a root 53 DNS entry, whatever, of the allocator service uh, that points to one cluster. And then when you've got a new cluster to spin up, you just swap it over. And then all the old players will continue to play on the old cluster until they're game sessions have finished, that cluster can then slowly scale down and disappear, and then all the new sessions will be getting allocated into the new cluster over time. And that's a relatively safe way of, uh, of, of testing that, um, testing that upgrade process. So hopefully we don't get review bombed on Metacritic. Okay. Um, so, to conclude, um, that was a whirlwind tour of Agones. Um, where it introduces a load of new concepts to Kubernetes, such as the fleets and the game servers, which are ways of actually running game servers in, in a Kubernetes clusters. It has these autoscalers for scaling them based on player demand versus your traditional metrics. You've got these allocator endpoints, which you can use to abstract the Agones away for something like a matchmaker to connect to and have a kind of multi-region deployment. Um, you may ask, like, at the end of the day, though, why did you try and do this? on Kubernetes, which is a good question. And the answer would be that a lot of these things we've described, while some of them are unique to the kind of nature of running in Kubernetes, a lot of these things we would have had to do anyway. Right? If we were just trying to run game servers in the cloud, like if we were doing this just on you know, normal VMs or something, we would still need a mechanism to know, OK, can I shut down this VM? Are players playing on it? How do I upgrade this? How do I autoscale this? Yeah, a lot of these questions and problems still exist. It just, it, it's so, we're, you know, we're building on the shoulders of giants by leveraging both Kubernetes and then Agonis as a way of simplifying this process. On top of that, um, and yeah, and that's, that pretty much covers it. Um, this is this QR code you can scan for the feedback, and there's um, uh, the slides if you want to see them have been uploaded. Um, yeah, uh, I'm around. Some of my colleagues from Place are around. If you want to chat, we are hiring. Have to plug that. Um, the Guerrilla guys uh, who are based in Amsterdam are also around. Um, so please talk to them. They're also interested in Goners and go play Horizon Burning Shores, which is launching today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's all. Right, we, we, we have time for questions, so if anyone has a question, fire. Stun silence. Okay. Oh, oh I see some hands. Um, is there a mic? Is there a mic guy? Is there a mic guy? I don't think there's a mic guy. I will just point. Okay. Yeah. Oh, how does the pod know? Yeah. So the the pod um, 
well, the game server, so the question was how does a pod know about like being allocated and stuff? So um, the, generally the game servers will integrate with the Agones uh, API using the SDK, so that they'll be aware of when they've, they've been sent a signal to say you, you've been allocated effectively, and they can also talk to this API to then say I'm, I've finished or something. Um, uh, there's also a sidecar that can be used if the game server um, might struggle having its code modified to integrate with the Gones SDK, but, um, but we would recommend, well, it's, it's up to you, but yeah, it has an SDK that you can use in the game server to do that kind of thing. Cool. Another question. Oh, there's a mic there. I think that is. Does that work? Oh, there one, go. two, three, one, two, three, yeah. So uh, what about uh, data collection? So if uh, the player is playing, uh, you need to store somewhere the, the information it's API, it's uh, persistent storage, uh, it's database. How how you manage that uh, from the because the, the containers are uh, not storing information, right? Yeah. So the, the question, just in case it's not on the track, um, was about like how are you storing like the players' data when they're playing on the game server? Um, and the answer is yeah. Generally, the game servers are stateless, so they won't be holding any state. Um, I'll finish at the end. Um, in terms of like where the data comes from, that is. That varies greatly depending on the game. Like, like we have like player information about like their ID and stuff, which will be coming from like the centralized PlayStation Network APIs. Um, but like more game-specific stuff, like I don't know what what's their loadout or something. There'll, there'll probably be a service that is respond like a loadout service of what what weapons does this person have, and that will be storing the data somewhere. Uh, again, depends on the game. You know, it could be a database. It could be any other kind of backend store. But yeah, but yeah, generally there'll be some other microservices that the game server server will go and like talk to to find this stuff out. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I had another question. Fire. One go. more question, please. Yeah, uh, here on the right side. Oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, no worries. <laughs> Um, my question is basically, uh, how do you know, or is there a, a concept or a, a process of where you scale a server or a, a game server during the game. So, for example, if you're running a, a game with like six players and uh, somehow suddenly ten uh, other players are joining and you probably would need to scale, is there some process for this? Uh, is the game server replaced or how is that handled? Yeah, so the question was like, if you need to scale up a game server during play, is that possible? Like if more players need to join a game server? And my answer would be maybe. Uh, it, um, it depends. Like, I, I have not personally done that. Like, generally, the game servers are set would, would be started, and they would kind of know how many players they can support. And if, if you needed a different, like, like let's say you're playing a game which is by default three v three, but then some modes are five v five, you'd probably just have different sets of game servers for each one. It would be uncommon to switch it during a match. That's not as common. So if you if you have like a game where like people can go back fields that could be between ten and twenty players, you'd probably just start up for twenty players. But there is like in place vertical pod auto scaling and stuff you can do in Kubernetes these days and that might be an interesting thing to look into, maybe. But yeah, okay. thanks. Cool. Do you have any experience in running Windows pods as game with game servers? Question was, do you have any experience running Windows pods game servers? Not personally, no. <laughs> uh, but generally, what we've been doing is trying to, you know, a lot of game servers weren't even containerized, right? So some of it's just been, that's been one of the challenges, like creating like headless versions of game servers that can be run in uh, containers and stuff has been a challenge. But no Windows ones that I've encountered so far, personally. No. We do support Windows, according to the Agonas man. Uh, <laughs> So. Is there time for one more question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you showed the like sort of the DNS Route 53 switchover from old cluster to new cluster. Um, I was just wondering, um, in terms of making sure that, like, of course, like marking that cluster as no longer to be allocating new sessions on. Mm -hmm. um, how what, how exactly does that mechanism work to prevent like that constantly recurring new game servers popping up on the old one and making sure it slowly drains to the last sessions? Yeah, well, that's so. The question was like, how do you make sure that like the old cluster gets drained when when you want to shut it down and make sure people don't keep playing on there? So, it it kind of depends on the game, I guess. Would be that I can use that for a lot of these questions, but it, um, it depends on what type of game it is. Like, if it's just kind of like a 
match-based game where you just play to the end of the round. At that point, you know, they get booted off the server and they would have to get a new server. And um, at that point, you send them to a new cluster. It's a much more interesting question when you get to more kind of open-worldy games where players can hang around for a long time. And I'll get back to you on that one because we haven't worked that one out yet. Yeah, <laughs> waiting for one player to leave the server. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah, leave yeah. now, please. No, yeah, I've had these, these this way. It keep me, keeps me up at night, those kind of thoughts. Okay. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. All right, cool. Okay, I think we're out of time. But yeah, I, I'm mostly around, so if you want to ask me any questions, feel free. Cool. Thank you.